You're listening to Catalyst Talks, conversations with change agents, outliers, superheroes, and truly conscious leaders modeling what it is to be an unstoppable force for good and truth in this world. What lit these catalysts on fire to do their work and what nuggets of wisdom can they share with a world literally on fire? I'm your host, Stephanie Traeger. I'm a transformational catalyst and life coach to maverick change agents in business, leadership, and life. On this podcast, I wear an eclectic mix of hats, including earthkeeper, wayfinder, truth teller, coach, lawyer, business, and impact strategist. My intention is holding space for higher purpose, peak wellness, soul mastery, and deeper impact so we can live in harmony with ourselves, each other, and nature. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. If you love it, please share and spread the word. We're on YouTube and all the podcast platforms. See the show notes on CatalystTalks.com for links and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome back to Catalyst Talks Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Your attention means the world to me. Today, my guest, Paul Rosalie, is a true superhero. He is doing phenomenal work as he plays in the jungle, writes epic novels based on his tales and adventures of, of, of conservation and joy. He models what it is to start a movement based on passion and joy, and he's worked to protect over 55,000 acres of pristine jungle in the Peruvian Amazon. His story, how he's going about this, he and his team, is amazing. And this conversation that we have is epic. So stay tuned for that. First, I want to share a minute on the inner work of impact and the deep dives that we have coming up this fall. So I will be hosting a series of workshops called the inner work of impact deep dives. And they are really for you if you are on a quest to unveil your higher purpose, if you want an understanding of how old stories, traumas, beliefs, mindsets are impacting you on any level in your life. It's an expansive journey to really widen our perception and activate multi-dimensional levels of perception. This is also a place where we want to explore our nexus between our personal work and our impact as change agents in the world and really dive in and step into a new way, a commitment to a new way of leadership. This is a transformational journey. And if you're somebody committed to your own evolution and transformation, this is for you, the inner work of impact. So please check out innerworkofimpact.com. And if you want to learn a little bit more about it, you can listen to the podcast episode I did before this one called the inner work of impact. And again, that's on YouTube and also all the, the podcast platforms at catalysttalks.com. So just so you know, coming up, we have the Higher Purpose Pivot. That's October 22nd. Your story is your medicine, follows that. And then we have Quantum Leap into Your Destiny by Mastering Your Powers of Perception and Visioning and Manifesting Your Powerful 2022. So you can learn more about those individual workshops on innerworkofimpact.com. You can sign up. Please, if you're interested, sign up soon or reach out with any questions because the vibe is intimate, space is limited. So check it out on innerworkofimpact.com. And now this episode. Hello, Paul. I'm so excited to have you here on Catalyst Talks podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Glad you got me. It's been so long since we've seen each other. I know. A little, a short little intro. You're an explorer. In fact, we actually met at the Explorers Club. We were just talking about that in New York True. City after I came back from the Peruvian Amazon in the Madre de Dios region, the Mother of God region. And somehow I found your book, Mother of God, An Extraordinary Journey into the Uncharted Tributaries of the Western Amazon. And I saw you'd be speaking at the Explorers Club. Of course, this I saw I had to be there. So after reading it, I came, I met you and I was just blown away. And so it's been awesome following your journey since then. I think it was in 2016. You have this obsession with anacondas. I want to hear all, we want to hear all about that today. And you've spent more than 16 years working to preserve threatened ecosystems all over the world. And your work in Peru is especially extraordinary. You're the co-founder of Jungle Keepers Peru, an organization that focuses on protecting threatened habitat in Western Amazonia and also Tamandua Expeditions. You've also authored a second book, a literary novel based on a true story, The Girl and the Tiger. Um, I'm just so grateful to have you here. And I really want, you know, one of the things I'm excited to, about is just sharing you with my community and inspiring people. Everyone wants to do good these days, right? And where do you start? But what you've done is extraordinary. And there's, it seems like there's a strategy behind the work that you're doing. So <laughs> I'm glad it seems like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, that's, that's something really good for people to know. If there's not, it's like, what do you do? How do you start? So tell us how you started. Like what, what is, Ooh. what does that spark for you? Um, yeah, for me, it was, it's, it was, I mean, it was so long ago now it was, the fact that I wanted to get out of high school 
I hated every second of my education from first grade up until I think 10th was the last grade that I did. And I kept reading books by Jane Goodall and all these, you know, just all these amazing books, Teddy Roosevelt stuff about all these people who'd done so much of their lives. And I was like, I'm sitting in a classroom every day. I was like, I'm being told I can't chew gum or go to the bathroom. You know, there's other people that were like out, you know, fighting in wars or like, you know, studying cures for diseases by this age. And so I like, I wanted to, I wanted to not be in the classroom anymore. And it turns out for everybody, for all the kids at home, uh, you don't have to do the last two years of high school. You can go get a GED, which you take this equivalency test and it's like a few hours and you can walk out and that's it. And then, so I did that and I started college. I started working at a YMCA as a lifeguard and started saving my money to get a plane ticket to the Amazon. Um, and one of the things that I end up always telling people is that when I was doing that, the first 10 people I asked about going to the Amazon all said no. Because at that time, getting down there was very difficult. Um, there was no, I don't believe there was a road down to Puerto Maldonado. Where I wanted to go, there, was, there, was, there wasn't even roads. Um, and so I asked this professor at my college, I said, you know, I really want to get to the, I know you run an Amazon field studies course, you know, I want to get down there. And he was like, oh, no, 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 unless you're a graduate student, unless you've done X, Y, Z, maybe, maybe in four or five years, you can go down. I said, no. Um, and then I asked a few other people, same, same deal. They just said, you're not ready. You, you're not qualified. You can't go. My parents said, no. I mean, it was just like, no, 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 no. And I had to just find a way. I had to find someone who was willing to take me. Um, and I recently, I keep, I keep telling people I had this in my in my dms now i get a lot of young people that are saying like you know how do i get started in conservation how do i do this um one had already completed his schooling for marine biology and he was like i really want to study great white sharks and he was like but the field is so saturated everybody wants to go out you know after sharks it's like studying big cats everybody wants to study big cats um and he was like i really don't know how to break in and like you know like start and i was like go to the docks go to South Africa, go to wherever, I think it's South Africa, go to wherever there's the most great whites and find the people that are studying great whites and go carry their bags, go make yourself useful for them, go film something for them that is so good that explains their work that it becomes something that's like their calling card, go do something that makes you useful to them. And if that doesn't work, because there's too many other kids standing on the docks, go to the next place with where there's great white scientists. Um, and it was really like that for me, like I just had to keep I just had sort of had to close my eyes and run forward. And that's really been a lot of my strategy over the years is just sort of run forward through the jungle. I love that because it's, it's, you know, if you're starting a business, you know, it's like mm -hmm. whatever you're doing, you take one step and then the next step becomes apparent. Um, yeah. But you also have to deal with like 20 no's in between each one of those steps. You know, I mean, I had a friend who was trying to start a company and manufacture, she'd never manufactured anything before. And it was like watching her go through the steps of learning where to manufacture things and how to not get taken advantage of. And it's like, you really, you got to talk to people. You got to find people who are doing almost what you want to do or doing what you want to do. And, and you got to off, you know, come in and offer something to it. But it's, uh, I just try to, I see so many people getting hit with their first one or two no's and then just sitting down mm -hmm. or like going back to whatever they were doing before. And it's like, if you really want it, you better get ready for a lot of no's. Publishing a book, try 35 different publishers, you know, and again, you're putting in hours and hours and writing proposals and sending them this and talking to them on the phone. And then they go, no, no, not for us. You know, it's like, you got to deal with lots of no's. And then the occasional no, where they're like, not only no, but you suck. And this book is awful and it'll never be anything. I got one of those. I kept it. I actually should frame it for mother of God, for mother of God, for mother of God. Actually, I got one that's really, um, he was a, he was a pretty hot shot agent like that. I really wanted. And he called me back and he was like, anacondas and floating forests. Like, you know, your paragraph about the book sounds incredible. Send me some chapters. I sent him some chapters. And then he was like, so how many books have you published before? And I said, none. This is my first book. He goes, how old are you? I said, it's like 22. And he goes, okay. And that seemed to take him down a notch. And then he, he read the chapters and he was like, your chapters are way too long. You're, you're, your your prose is way too at it you know just insane and he was like you're way too excited about everything he was like i just see a kid here that has nothing to say he's like you're just trying to impress people with your adventures and he was like and he went on for a whole page there was more than that but it, i was like i was like maybe i shouldn't be doing this you know like but wow um wow, everybody listening you've got to read this book it's, <laughs> it's so real though every every because i had just come back from there and i've spent lots of time in the jungle and i I spent, you know, a, many, many years as a forest activist myself. And so I read your book. I was like, 
dude speaking truth and like <laughs> just what passion is when you care so much. Yeah. And it, it comes through. So tell us about, tell, tell, what's the story? I mean, you got down there and how is it that you have managed to create Jungle Keepers and the expeditions and Las Piedras, if I'm saying that right. And what is all of this and how did you create it? <laughs> um, it's really just got down there and started doing what I love. And what I loved was exploring the forest. The, I mean, just the giant Kapok trees and the spider monkeys and howler monkeys and capuchins and snakes all over the place, which are, you know, people think it's easy to find snakes in the forest. Like they'll jump on your head like it's the movies. We spend 10 hours walking, looking for snakes, you know, with headlamps at night, still find maybe one or two little snakes um, and forget altogether about anacondas. That's like you're going out looking for a dragon. It's going to take you the time to find it. Um, but in the early days, I was I was wearing jeans in the jungle, man. That was the that was the way I think of the chapter. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea that you should be wearing quick dry stuff. You, you know, I was I had all the wrong gear on. I had I had hiking boots, which once you get water in hiking boots, they're going to stay wet. So hiking boots is a terrible idea in the jungle. Uh, I had jeans on because I didn't have quick dry pants at that point. Just absolutely no idea what I was doing. But I made friends with the locals and um, JJ, who who started being my main teacher and friend we started going out and looking for snakes and tracking wildlife and he knew all about the wildlife all about the medicinal plants the one thing he didn't know about was snakes it was the one thing like in their community they don't eat snakes they don't deal with snakes they're just scared of them and i had grown up rescuing snakes handling snakes and so i was like look i will teach you the one thing i know that you don't and he was like well okay you have access to the entire encyclopedia of my knowledge and i was um and then when it was time for me to leave, after having all these amazing experiences in the Amazon, I said, you know, I really want to come back. Is there anything I can do to, to help you guys? And at that time, it was him and his partner, and they were running their sort of like research ecotourism out in the forest, but they didn't have anybody back in town taking reservations, marketing, doing anything like that. So it was like they're their machine was not working very smoothly. And so I was like, you know, he's like, we need more gringos. We need more, more clients. And I was like, I got the gringos. I was like, I can bring you gringos. Um, and then I did, I showed all my friends these crazy pictures of, you know, butterfly tornadoes and caiman and jaguars and all this stuff. And then people came and then their friends came and then, and then little by little by little by little. And that's how Tamandua started. And then to, with Tamandua, it was like, okay, cool. Like ecotourism can help protect this river. Um, and then 2009, we had the Trans-Amazon Highway come in. The Trans-Amazon Highway is cut all the way from the Atlantic Ocean straight across the Amazon to the Pacific Ocean. It's the first time in history a land trade route has been opened across Amazonia, which also makes the timber accessible to Asia. Um, it's been called the worst environmental project that's ever happened on Earth because of how many indigenous tribes have been destroyed, because of how much biodiversity has been lost, because of how much will be lost from the timber extraction. It's absolutely awful. And every year there's offshoot roads coming off of the Trans-Amazon Highway. So it's just metastasizing across the Amazon. You can see it if you go on Google Earth and look at like historical data, um, historical imagery, you can see the, 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 this bleaching of the forest. What was once dark green becomes something else. And it's absolutely horrible to watch. But one of those roads came out on Las Piedras. And that's when JJ was like, we got to do something bigger. We have to do something you know, a little bit of ecotourism, we're protecting this one little spot in the forest and, and that's great. Um, but how do we actually stop the land? Because we, we were watching the entire football fields go down, just them cutting and cutting and every year it was getting worse. And that's where the idea of jungle keepers came from. The idea of the people that, the keepers of the jungle, the people that are protecting this place, the ancient forest, because the spider monkeys, the jaguars, all the millions and millions and millions of heartbeats that live in that forest, though they can't, they have no way to protect themselves. You know, I think it, people have varying views on, on what an animal is or, you know, inherent value versus is it utilitarian for us? Um, but they are part of that ecosystem and they're, you, you almost can't think about any one species in the Amazon without considering the whole because everything is so interconnected and not only is it the wildlife but up further on las piedras we have uncontacted tribes there are literally people who live naked in the forest have never seen or never never made they don't have metal they, they don't they don't have spoons forks even the most basic things they've missed out on the wheel 
So they'll see us maybe flying over in planes once in a while. There's not many planes out there, but for the most part, they live completely isolated out in the forest. So if the Peruvian government or a corporation decides to come in and bulldoze that entire river, they have no way of stopping that. They have no way of protesting. They can't go tweet about it. They're completely isolated. So protecting the forest is sort of a secondary protection for these people that live out there. Um, but yeah, all of it, all of it happened kind of gradually. It started with taking people to the forest and sharing the thing that we loved, which was just look at how amazing this place is. And then it grew into research projects and then it grew in, you know, and I tried the television route and I tried writing and I tried, you know, social media, I tried all these different things to say like, okay, how do we actually, and it went from being a teenager going like, this is amazing. I get to run around in the Amazon to now, I mean, as I'm 33 years old and I'm, I have a team of rangers and we're protecting 55,000 acres. We're protecting a huge portion of this river. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange how it ballooned. I definitely didn't have a, have a, have a plan when I started I, when I started, my plan was get to enjoy the Amazon. And then little by little, it, it kind of, kind of ratcheted up over the years. So then, so the ranger program that you have or the, mm-hmm. how does this work? You've, I've, you know, if for anyone who is not following, uh, who hasn't seen Paul on Instagram, go follow now. <laughs> go. But yeah, there's just this beautiful narrative unfolding and we get to see your stories around, you know, seeing illegal logging, seeing illegal mining, like, you know, so part of that exploration. And I also want to hear about those, those, you know, solo journeys you've taken into the, into the, into the jungle. <laughs> like, what do you even say? It's beyond. Yeah. But uh, yeah, how did you how did you come to find the illegal loggers, and how did how did you ins- you know I don't know what I'm trying to say, but how did yeah. you, you know, like how did you put it all together? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, once that road came off the Trans Amazon, we saw a lot more deforestation happening, and so the idea was like, you know, a lot of the local loggers, they're not you know because as you're driving up and down the river, there's sort of like that outdoors culture where it's like you know if somebody has their motor broken and you see them on the side, like we'll pull over and help them. And like a lot of times we'll be like, Hey, you know, guys, what's going on? What are you doing here? And they'd be like, Oh, we came to cut some trees. And it's like, cool. You know, all right, cool. All right. Well, what are you doing? It's like, Oh, we're here to protect the forest. And it's like, we're all just like, you know, whatever. It's like, Oh, cool. We got bananas. You want some, like, we'll just like chill out. Like um, these guys are not bad guys. Um, not to mention that JJ himself has, I think 16 brothers and, and half of them were loggers. Um, so we really it just sort of came up with the idea of just the, why not just and plus the the example set by so many conservation organizations in Africa of just take the poachers and turn them into conservationists just hire them um, and pay them pay them a little bit better and educate them and though they'd be happy to protect it in a lot of cases the people that work out in the forest are people that know the forest well which is why extracting from the forest is like the one thing they can do because they know how to do it. Um, so if you take like a, a, a poacher who's going out and tracking, chances are that guy grew up hunting with his dad. He's maybe even as indigenous, like they are doing that because they might not understand the modern economy and how to, how to make themselves valuable in there. And so they're like, okay, well, I'll go out and I'll hunt a bunch of this and sell it. Got it. That's like their one plan. So if you go in there and you're like, Hey, look, you've been driving boats for loggers for the last 15 years. So you're an expert boat driver, right? And they're like, uh-huh. Why don't you drive boats for us? You don't got to be around falling trees. You don't got to be running from the authorities. Just all you got to do is drive boats for a bunch of gringos. They love it. Our one, our favorite new boat driver is uh, Victor. And he had, he'd been a logger for years and years and years. Crazy stories, this guy. I mean, he's been shot at by the uncontacted tribes. He was once lost in the forest for so long that he was pronounced dead. And then uh, floated back to town on a log. And like two weeks later, his friends were like, you're alive. He was like, yeah, and he like survived with just a machete and like nothing else in the forest for two weeks. Um, but he he used to be a logger up until pretty recently. And then we literally were like, hey, look, could you drive boat for us? And he was like, uh-huh. And then once he once he got into the culture, once it was like, oh, we protect this river. We're the jungle keepers. Now he's working for jungle keepers. He's literally stationed protecting the forest, helping our rangers with boat stuff, doing handyman work. His wife is so... She's uh, from one of the indigenous communities on the river, and she's just she's very quiet. Um, she speaks only about half Spanish, and she also speaks their native dialect, Yine. But every morning you get up at six, six in the morning, and like she's fishing. Like she, her 
her diet consists more of the forest than it does of anything else. Like she's so, she's so talented in the forest and so like built into that because that's how she grew up. And so like having them on the team is one of the things that makes Jungle Keepers, I think, unique is the fact that we have people that like know this river, know this forest. And so if you give them the chance to protect it, they probably just never had that before. We have a few other of our rangers. Uh, one of our rangers, Yoni, used to be used to be a logger as well. We have a ranger named Ignacio who's from one of the communities way up the Las Piedras River. And I'll send you pictures of this, um, but he actually several years ago was out on the banks of the Las Piedras River and there was uncontacted tribes across the river. And these tribes have six foot bow and arrows, six foot arrows to go with them at these huge bamboo tips. And he was out on the river and someone shot an arrow and he didn't see it until the last second. And right as it was about to go through his eye, he moved his head to the side. And so it cut him, opened his skin across his cranium, basically from his temple all the way back to behind his ear. And so he's got this crazy scar going back on his head. But it's like when you when you try to explain to people just how wild this river is, it's like, this is modern times. We're on a Zoom call right now. These people are carrying around bows and arrows. Like this is this place is wild. And so hiring people that have grown up in that environment and that that know it on an expert level for decades and decades. That's what makes our ranger team, I think, really something something unique because you're taking the the same people that live there that could be taking it apart and it's just saying, look, you are the keepers of this place, your way of life, everything. This is we're just really just empowering local people to protect their cultural heritage and the environment around them. So how does that replace their livelihood? Uh, well, really nicely, actually, because logging or, or farming or hunting or something doesn't necessarily guarantee pay, whereas like with us, there's some payroll, <laughs> like um, it, it works really nice. In fact, like for like um, one of the guys we work with, he used to be an illegal gold miner. And when I met him, the Peruvian Navy was bombing him. Um, and so like he was used to like working with mercury and like running from the law and getting blown up by the Navy and all this stuff. And like, this guy clearly loves the forest, like going out with him. I had gone out with him to look for anacondas. Um, and he loves the forest. And I was like, why don't I showed him pictures on my phone? I was scrolling through my phone. I was going, why don't you just do this? He was like, nobody ever asked me. He was like, I just, he's like, he goes, my dad is a gold miner. I'm a gold miner. He built a lodge and now we bring people to him and, and he loves guiding people around and driving them through the jungle. And he's now helping the Peruvian Navy catch gold miners because he wants to protect the river because now he sees his whole river, every monkey, every caiman, every animal, every jaguar, he's going, this is part of my livelihood because I need the jungle to be as vibrant and as wild as possible so that when people come to me, they, they recommend it to their friends because they get to see the most pristine, beautiful Amazon possible. So anybody that's messing with that is messing with him. And so that is something where it's really, you create a culture of conservation. And so this stuff is so easy, actually, at the end of the day, you know, I always say like, how stupid is conservation? We're trying to, we're, all we really have to do is nothing. And we're trying to put ourselves out of business. That's your goal as a conservationist. You want to get to the point where there's nothing left to save and you can just go surfing You just get a normal job, just like do something normal. Um, but we're really just trying to get people to not cut down trees. You know, like people are like, oh, we have to save the, you know, whatever it is, the tigers, whatever. You don't just save tigers. You got to convince people to stop bulldozing their habitat and killing all the deer that they eat. Tigers will be fine. Tigers were here before we were. Same goes for the wolves and the eagles and everything else. It's not an animal problem. It's not a nature problem. So like when people go, oh, we're losing elephants. We're not losing elephants. We're allowing them to be murdered systemically. Um, so that's that's one of those things where it's just, it's kind of it's kind of funny with conservation because it almost seems like there's like, a naturally occurring die off and there's not it's just that we are there's a lot of humans on earth right now and we're very disorganized i love that it's a it's a real switch in paradigm from save yeah. or create solutions versus stop stop creating harm <laughs> yeah that's a great way of putting it actually yeah um yeah just to i really because like you know just thinking about people going we're losing the the whatever you know the the panda bears, no, we're not. We're bulldozing ban bamboo forests. Like we're not. The, my favorite example is humpback whales. We're down to, I think they went from about 125,000 pre whaling. And then whaling took them down to about seven or 8,000 globally, I believe. Um, and then the whole, the whole revolution happened with banning whaling. And that's because people got together and did it. They said, there's no whales out there. 
there's hardly any whales left in the ocean. If we're going to have whales, we have to ban whaling. And also there's other ways of getting that oil at that point too. So thankfully technology. Um, but now humpback whales are back up to almost pre-whaling numbers. I think they crossed over 100,000 globally. I could be wrong. I've, I've heard 80, I've heard 110, but the, the general narrative is that we're up around where they were pre-whaling numbers. And it's like, all we did was nothing. As soon as we stopped firing harpoons into their heads with cannons, they lived. Amazing. Amazing. How did, how did we think of this? So how is Jungle Keepers funded? Like how are, how, what is the economy going on here? How are you guys funding the Rangers? Um, we have a few different donors prim primarily right now. Um, this was, this was something that was incredible. Um, well, I'll tell the whole story. All right. Um, and this is the, the reason I want to tell the whole story is because when you're trying to get something done, whether it's starting a company or selling your art or whatever it is, um, you got to try a million different things and you're going to fail at a million different things. And that's one of the, one of the looking back on my, on my trajectory, that's one of the most fascinating things to me, because when I started, it was like, okay, ecotourism, I'll take people to the jungle sooner or later. One of these people is just going to be able and have the resources to help us protect it. But you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Um, so then that didn't work. So then we started jungle keepers and it's kind of had a slow start. We didn't have the right people yet. Um, or, or rather our team, we, we needed, we needed the full team that we didn't have at that point. Um, you know, and then I tried, I tried working for discovery channel. I said, Oh, well, if I get famous as like a naturalist person, like that'll work. And so I tried to get eaten by an anaconda and I had global and national coverage and everybody went crazy. And I, it got completely lost and televisioned and I got Hollywooded so hard and came out the other side and said, that didn't work. That was a hard one. Um, wrote a book that did okay. And then the funny thing is, is that after all that, um, there was a day in 20, I think it was 2018 when we were driving on the side of the road. And whenever I see the, the fires in the Amazon, I pull over, you know, and I take a few shots because you see these big, giant, beautiful trees, these, you know, 500 or 1,000 year old trees burning. You see the monkeys all running for it. The birds are coming out of the canopy. You got 70 foot walls of flames. Um, and that forest, that, that very, very complex ecosystem will never you know, be replaced in our lifetimes. That's it. So you're watching something incredibly profound taking place in front of you, physically changing before your eyes that'll never go back. Um, and so I always stop and just sort of document it because I feel like that's the, the only thing I can do. I certainly not can't put out a 70 foot wall of flames, but I did that, you know, whatever. And then I was like that day, that particular day, I was just so angry about it. I was yes, shouting into my phone and swearing and all this stuff. And I think I was calling out like <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio and Jane Goodall. I was like, I was like yelling at all these people. I was like, somebody has to do something about this. And then a few months passed and that was just a video that was on my phone. And then one night uh, in 2019, when the Amazon fires were about to hit the news real big, the first few articles, I think like 10 different people had already sent me like, hey, the Amazon's burning. Hey, the Amazon's burning. Hey, the Amazon's burning. And it just got me annoyed. And I was like, yeah, the Amazon's always burning. The Amazon's been burning for less 30 years and I've been seeing it for 15. And I just, I threw that video up. And I remember that I put it up on Instagram and I took my phone and put it on top of the refrigerator and went to bed. And in the morning, the phone had vibrated off the refrigerator and fallen onto the ground. There was 40,000 new followers on the Instagram and there was like 17 missed calls. And finally I picked up the phone and it was like the news. And they were like, Hey, can you, basically that video had gone viral while I was asleep. And so I woke up to this crazy shock and then spent the next. I shared that video too. I shared that all over the place. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was amazing. And some of the, some of the places it was popping up, I mean, it just went all over the world and you know, all kinds of people were sharing it. And I spent the next like three weeks in green rooms. And suddenly I was like sitting next to Bill McKibben you know, on the news talking about the Amazon. And it was like, from, from looking for snakes in my jeans at 18, it was, it was kind of like, whoa. And like, you know, now I was suddenly sitting there um, representing the jungle. And through that, we got the attention of this Canadian entrepreneur named Dax De Silva. And he is, I'm not sure how much I can say about it yet, but he's starting, starting some projects um, through through an organization called Age of Union that is aimed at bringing together a lot of the conservation community, a lot of the art community, a lot of the spiritual community to sort of take these big 
themed problems and actually create like workable solutions to them. Like it's really just to start a new chapter. And um, that's, that's where a lot of, that's the answer to where a lot of the funding for jungle keepers comes from is that we, we, we've had an amazing ride to get there for that, but the, our boats, our rangers, our, I mean, our camera equipment, everything that we need, our strategy, our, our legal, everything just comes from right now from, from age of union support. They're really making that possible. And it's crazy because, you know, growing up, conservation was so dark. You know, even you watch a David Attenborough thing and it was like, you know, look at these beautiful penguins. And he's like, yes, but the penguins soon will be, you know, all of them are going to die as glaciers melt. And it was like, oh, sure. Like I'm, you're sitting in your living room as a kid and you're like, wait a second. So the, yeah, that's beautiful. And it's all going to die. You're like, oh, maybe I'll go suffocate myself. <laughs> like um, <laughs> conservation's always been super doom and gloom. And it's like, we I've been kind of holding them close. I can't I can't I, can't, I haven't released them yet because we're getting ready for like the big release. But um, we've, we've been having we've been notching some wins in the last few years. And it's like it feels good to have that for people, because when you share something like the Amazon fires video or or any other news about extinctions or something, so many people, my inboxes are filled with people that are like, I can't take it you know, the environmental stress of a dying world. And, you know, my kid doesn't want to eat. And then people really feel this. They really do care, which is which is a great and positive thing. But they need good news. They need good news, too. We need good news. I mean, you can't just constantly hear about losses in the war. You know, there has to be good news. And that's why holding on to things like the humpback whales coming back, the fact that scientists and citizen activists saved bald eagles. I mean, they were going extinct in the 70s. Um, things can get better. Things 100% can get better. Um, we're even seeing tigers come back in some areas. And in the Amazon, we are protecting some pretty significant tracts of land and there are stunning bits of forest. So I'm, that's one of the things I'm waiting. I'm holding this in, waiting to share it with people. Well, you'll have to come back and share it. <laughs> Got me. Deal, deal. <laughs> when I was um, like, let's say about, 20 something years ago, I was an environment, a forest activist in California, in Northern California, the, the ancient redwoods. I, I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, you can't cut these ancient beings. So How for me, you? Yeah. you know, and, and we were watching them. And it's interesting having just passed 9-11 uh, because I was also, I was in New York City in 9-11, like under the buildings falling. And I remember standing there watching people jump out of the buildings, the buildings crumbling down, the being covered by the smoke. And in, in that moment, it, that was after my time in California. Actually, that's why I was moved to New York to go to law school. But the, it was I was standing there watching these buildings fall and thinking about what it looked like to see an ancient redwood fall. Mm. And it was like 3,000 people maybe in this building, 3,000 year old tree. Like, why don't we get the, why don't we get how the value of life? And so, you know, animals can come back ancient trees can't. So tell us a little bit about your experience in these primeval forests, in these ancient forests that we cannot, we're not going to get them back mm -hmm. in for thousands of years because they're thousands of years old. So what is so special about the intelligence of this, of the jungles that you know that are? Yeah. I mean, when we, it's, it's kind of crazy because when you walk through the forest, the first time you see the Amazon, I feel like everybody has the same reaction that you walk through it and you, you know, they're amazed at the size of things, you know, there's leaves that are bigger than you are. And there's these trees that are as big as a living room going up. And, but the, the complexity of, of the foliage makes it so like, everyone's just like, it's just green stuff. And you're just like, it's just all green. And then as you spend more time there, as you, I mean, and for us, I mean, after 15 years, it's just starting to focus, you know, it's just starting to go where I can go. Okay. This, this, um, but I mean, you have leaf cutter ants, you take a single tree, a single tree and like in the vines that are going up that tree you'll have leaf cutter ants how many different species of birds reptiles snakes lizards tarantulas scorpions praying mantises monkeys up top i mean there's just there's so much life that literally like you said trade center like a skyscraper like it's literally a skyscraper of life and little us on the forest floor is just this tiny little thing and then up above are these 150 feet up are these giant branches that are the size of oak trees you know and i'm from upstate new york and it's like these are the biggest trees that i know and these are just the branches of these trees like um this the past few years we've figured out on a few of these trees how to get up into the canopy and like you can walk around it's like avatar you can walk around on the trees uh, on the on the branches up there and there's completely different plants growing on top you have like these waxy cuticle plants and 
orchids and cactuses and down there you have totally different you know so it's like everything everything is so specialized to different levels of the rainforest and there's so much life so you move remove that one tree it's like it's like destroying a whole mountain you know and there's all these little microclimates and in, in the bromeliads that are growing there there's these little pockets of water where there's frogs and some frogs only nest in those certain little pools and it's like it's so specialized so I don't think that the average person understands that. I think that it sounds, it sounds kind of fantasy. Like, you know, it sounds like something from Narnia when you, when you talk about how much, you know, it's like, it's like, it just doesn't sound realistic. But then when you go there and you see it, I remember the first time I saw leaf cutter ants, I fell to my knees. I was like, there's no way these are real. And all the locals are like, looking at me like, hey, look, just carry the bags, just keep carrying the bags. Um, and I was like, but these are leaf cutter ants and like leaf cutter ants, for example, I believe recycle 17% of the total biomass of the Amazon, which when you look at how much stuff there is there, you know, the biomass is the total amount of dried organic material, not including water. They're recycling 17% of that. That's a huge amount. That's almost a fifth of the entire forest is being recycled through their colonies. And in those colonies, they're farming, they're using all that organic material to farm a fungus that exists nowhere else in nature that they create that's their sole source of food it's crazy i mean there's something like 40 species of fishing bat in the amazon that's just the fishing bats it's not the fruit that's not the fruit bats it's not the insectivorous bats just the fishing ones 40. um 4, species of butterflies something similar with dragonflies it's just the the species count is off uh you know sort of just above anything that you can think of and so to cut Forest. I remember when uh, when Notre Dame caught on fire, and everyone was, you know, sort of. This, I remember I woke up and you saw the, you know, the steeple of Notre Dame and all the flames and everything. And I you know, just and everyone. There was a lot of sort of misguided comparison where everyone was going, you know, how come everyone cares about a church but no one cares about the environment, or how come everyone cares about a church but no one cares about like you know, whatever other thing their issue was. Which which I, I do think everyone's got to just chill out with like um, trying to relate their <laughs> their issue to everything that happens on earth. Um, Cause everyone knows about a church. Everyone knows that it's a big, beautiful, famous church on earth, even if you've never seen it. Um, but there definitely is a parallel to that. When you watch these ancient trees going, where you used to say, well, people don't know about this particular tree, but that tree, when the Spanish, I mean, hell, when Columbus got to the, you know, to the, to the, to the new world, um, some of these trees were saplings, you know, and, World War One, World War Two, the formation of the U.S., whatever, you, whatever you want to, whatever recent historical event you can say, the last five, six, seven hundred years, these trees were around for that. They were standing quietly in the Amazon, producing for all of that time. And so, to lose something like that is is a horrendous thing to see. But yeah, we have to, and that's the other thing. I'm very, I'm very, very harsh on when people are like, oh, like, like we're losing forests. Like, let's just plant trees. No, no. Yeah. That's like, that's like, you know what that's like? And um, yesterday I posted something about the thylacine, the marsupial dog um, that went extinct, I think in the 1930s. And people were like, oh, well, we can just bring them back genetically. And like, you know, and they, a few people in the comments were telling me uh, that, that they're going to try and bring back the woolly mammoths. And I've been following this woolly mammoth project for, you know, a decade or more. And even if they use an Asian elephant egg and insert the, you know, the DNA of the woolly mammoth and stuff, you're going to create a partial, mostly woolly mammoth like looking thing that will exist probably in captivity and have nowhere in the real world to go. Um, and, and so is that bringing back a woolly mammoth is a species still a species if it is disconnected from everything around it. Not really. That's like saying, you know, Oh, you, your mom's going to die in a car crash today. We'll go we'll get you another mom. Don't worry about it. It's like, nope, not the same thing. It's not my mom. You know, it's like, you can't, you can't take an animal out of its environment. You know, you take a hummingbird out of the Amazon. It's like, well, what, what flowers does that hummingbird pollinate? What other things, what other connections are there in the ecosystem? And with woolly mammoths, it's like you, you, you bring back this major megafauna historic thing that you need probably, you know, you need to, first of all, you better plan on making dozens and dozens of them to start off the population. And then what are you going to do? You're going to release them into the tundra and are people going to be allowed to hunt them or not? And are they really going to be woolly mammoths? And do they have the culture, you know, different tigers teach their, their cubs how to hunt. And some of them, some of them will teach them to mimic 
dog calls so that a dog will come close in urbanized areas so that they can get the dogs right off the street. There's, a, there's another tiger in Renthambore that taught her cubs to chase the sambar deer into water because that guaranteed that they would slow down. And a tiger is a faster swimmer, even though the sambar are faster runners. And so there is culture in these animals of what they teach their young to do that gets passed down. And that's why you can never have, once a, you know, a captive raised tiger can never be wild again. They will starve unless the mother teaches them. As far as I know, we've never, ever had a tiger that was raised in captivity released into the wild and survive. It's never happened. It's too complex. And so this idea of, of bringing things back or like, oh, you could just plant a tree. It's not just a tree. It's a tree with thousands and thousands of other species on it. I mean, even baby sloths, when they're born, they inherit, they inherit, they inherit a type of moth from their mother that lives in their fur. So these, and they, all this algae that comes off the mother's fur. So they're inheriting this whole other ecosystem that lives on them. From, babe, from mother sloth to baby sloth. So it's like, it's really not, it's not possible to pick one thing out like that. And I think that people get very simplified with it. It's like, you know, oh, I have a snake that I keep in a terrarium. It's like, I have a snake. It's like, yeah, but it's not, it's not the same thing. Hmm. Hmm. There's so much there. And that's <laughs> what we can see. Like that's the visible. If you look yeah. it's visible, right? And then there's sure. the, in the invisible. Like, how do we know that all of the ancient trees, like once you hit a thousand, you're part of the ancient tree club and you get to communicate with all the other ancient trees. All <laughs> oh. the planet, and then you have like a purpose that's, that's invisible to humans, but there's some other intelligence, you know? I mean, that's my experience with ancient trees. I've also lived up in the canopies and, you know, lived, I wouldn't say, but hung out in the canopies in the redwoods. And it's like another world up there, but you also are, there's like an intelligence going on that is invisible to humans. So there's so much more happening in the invisible. What would you say about your experience in the jungle and the invisible? Oh, um, I mean, I'm, I make no secret out of the fact that I, I, the jungle is my church. You know, that's, that's going into a building. There's beautiful buildings and stuff, but I, I think the, the most meaning I see is out in nature. Um, but yeah, it, certainly if you want to communicate with the trees, you better be drinking ayahuasca because then they'll, 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 they'll become real talkative. Trust me. <laughs> Have you ever done it? Communicated with trees? Yes. No, drank ayahuasca in the jungle. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's <laughs> in your jungle. I've been in Peru in the, in the Madre de Dios area. But uh, yeah, among some other um, experiences. However... The, you don't need to drink ayahuasca to communicate with them. I mean, my, my time in, my time in the, the forest in Northern California and, and just when I was in my early 20s, that was like this, oh, wow, these trees talk and I could hear them. And that was not with plant medicine. So yeah, <laughs> it's a little louder with the medicine, but they are talking and communicating on some other levels. So, but yeah, so tell us about your journey in the jungle with like you, just your your deeper connection. I'm really curious about this because I know that I've read in your book, you talk about these solo journeys you've gone on and you know that's where you actually, you're like initiated, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't actually know anyone that else that has done this on purpose. I know people have been lost, but to go out voluntarily into the Amazon is incredibly dangerous um some of the things that i've done myself i look at and i go what was i thinking like how um and even the locals who drop me off you know you take a boat up a river for four days to go way past you know, you find the last village and then you go you keep going and then you get dropped off and you go what's you know where where is this that you're dropping me off what's it called and they go you know the last thing with a name is right back there this is something you know they, they you're just you're just out in the amazon and so um, on so many levels, it's a very intense experience. I and mean, we're extremely social species. When we're born, you're born into probably a hospital room with your parents, doctors, you know, everyone's around. And then you go to school and our whole lives, we see humans every single day. There's never a time that we don't. And most of us now have smartphones and we have access to social media and we're just surrounded by communication, communication, constantly, constantly communicating. Um, it actually makes me think of the macaws because wherever the macaws fly in the forest, they're constantly, they're constantly, they're constantly communicating vocally with each other. Um, but then all of a sudden when you're out in the wilderness, completely alone, especially out there, because, you know, I've been out in the mountains and you feel like, okay, I'm out for a hike. And if I get into trouble, I probably can call a helicopter, like, you know, 
out there, there's no one to call. There's no one that's going to come get you. And you just get this very, very complete feeling of that you are on a different planet because it's such a different reality. You know, there's no, you also realize how, how much we've altered our reality. You know, we have sidewalks that are perfectly flat for us and we have a refrigerator to keep our food good. And we have a store where we can get food, you know, get that food. And it's like, when you're out in the forest, you're like, okay, I have, I have a few rations and I have, uh, you know, batteries and I have my headlamp and, you know, in order to stay safe from the bugs, you're going to have to be, you know, rubbing certain um, compounds and certain leaves on yourself to, to you, cause I don't want to smell like store-bought insect, you know, uh, insect repellent. I never, I almost never use that unless we're doing field work that has to have me sitting down and I'm just going to get destroyed. But on a normal day, I never do that. I try and smell like the forest. I think that that is one of the secrets that allows me to have better animal settings than a lot of people. I think I just smell like a dirty jungle animal. And so they don't, you know, if you smell like shampoo and conditioner and you're walking through the forest, that's like, you might as well just have like a fire truck siren on you just to animals saying, here I am, I'm a human. Um, whereas if you smell like dirty, sweaty jungle fungus, <laughs> chances are um, you're, 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 olfactory profile will be like way less for them. Um, and everything there is based on smell, but being out alone is, is incredibly strange, um, and profound. It's almost, it's almost impossible to describe it. You start, you start like replaying everything in your life right away. There's, there's, it's just a totally different reality. Encounters with animals are so different because you look at them a lot more the way you'd like, you know, smile at a mailman or something. It's like, you see like the, you know, the taper swimming across the river and you're like, Oh, Hey, you know, there you go. And it's like the animals and everything. And like, when you get lost, I remember there was one experience where I had been lost for like a day in a swamp and it was a really terrifying deep swamp that just didn't end ever. Um, I was starting to think of uh, that movie never ending story where he loses his horse in the swamps of sadness. Um, but it was just this horrible, horrible swamp. And I was starting to think like, I might die in here. And then I finally came back to an area where I was like getting near to the river and I could tell by the, by the wildlife, I could tell by the species I was seeing that I was getting close to a river and it was so good to see them. It was like, it was like seeing faces I recognized. It was like, oh, you guys. It's like, yes, yes, yes. Yo, I was like, what's happening? Like, so excited to see you again. Um, and so like the animals become like neighbors and when the local people talk, they, they talk of it like um, as if each animal has a personality and that animal is a character. So no matter where you are, it's like, you know, the fox does this. The jaguar, she hates it when we, you know, when, if, you, if you see her before she sees you, she hates it and she feels so embarrassed. Like you just, they, they, they have, you know, the harpy eagles, you know, they, they don't want you to see them. Like they, there's just these personalities, like the river otter will, will come up to you and like scold you for being in their lake. And it's like, it's, it's very interesting because it becomes like these, this cast of characters and it's like, it's an ongoing thing. Um, and that's kind of like the way it is in nature. It's like, you know, river otters are river otters. There's generations and generations and generations of river otters and generations and generations of humans. Um, and there's a continuity there. And that's sort of something that I think that we don't usually uh, you know, we're all usually so focused on us and our lives and you don't really zoom out to look at it from a tree's perspective of 500 years at a time and say like, oh, we're actually just here for a second. We're just like a little mosquito here that's here this year and next year there's going to be other ones. Um, and so when you're out there, all that, all that big heady stuff and the fact that you could see the Milky Way in complete HD every night because there's no light pollution, that makes it even worse. <laughs> you start going, oh my God. Um, it, it, it is really, really wild being out there. It's, I find it, I have, I have about a week and a half in me before the alarm bells start going off where I start going like, I just want to, I just want to go back and see people. You know, I love going out there and I love going on adventures. And then there comes a point with the true solo stuff. You know, if you're out there with three of your best friends and you know, the local team and everything you're out there, you can, you can go for months and months. I don't care. But if you're out there truly, truly alone, you start going, well, wow. You know, you go, it's almost like you, it's almost like you're on a different uh, plane of reality. Um, the movie in the movie Interstellar, it actually made me think of the jungle because they end up on these foreign planets where there's like nothing like silent planets where it's just like water and stuff. And there's parts where they'll, they'll go through different dimensions and they end up on these planets and 
there are days where I'd wake up in the Amazon and the sun would be coming up through the mist and everything would be like, you know, grayscale, black and white. And it would just look like an alien planet. And I would just be like, you know, covered in mud to keep the mosquitoes off and just sitting there just being like, I, there's no one else in this part of my planet. And this is what it was like. There's nothing I can see that's human. And that to me is something that having that perspective, we you know we're the places where you go where the animals are so unconditioned to humans that it's like the Galapagos where in the sense that they don't even know to be scared of you. You know, if you see a Jaguar uh, in a lot of places where, where boat traffic is common, they go, oh, that's a human. It could shoot me. I got to get out of here. If you see a Jaguar way out there in those places, they walk up to you and they're like, I'm a Jaguar. I got nothing to fear. What are you? They don't care. And so there's a difference there and having that reference point to come back and tell people about um because otherwise people come to the you know the forest and they say oh it looks like the rainforest it's great it's like no well you know it's we don't have jaguars out on the beaches anymore because they've all been shot or because they're all scared and it's like you can i think it's very important for me with the work i do to have that that sort of reference point of what does it mean to be truly truly at the height of wild and at the height of you know richness and diversity for species um, and so going on those things spiritually as a storyteller, as a conservationist, I think that that's a huge part of my initiation and training to do this job. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I love um, I love the part about how the in native people, the local indigenous people or people who are so connected to the animals and just their environment I mean, that. Yeah. That's a really good answer to people who say, I want to get into conservation. What do I do? I care so much. It's like, well, just start connecting with the environment around you and recognize that these are the tree. They don't all exist for us, right? We're just very, we're all part of this. Yeah. They have their own reasons for existing. So it has nothing to do with us. That's a huge paradigm shift for people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's just a, it's a really important new way we need to look at the world is like, okay, go talk to the tree and see if the tree has something to say and, and the squirrel sure, sure. and what's the personality of the squirrel? Like, that's what lives around me. Sure. You know, do I know? Like, that's, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I 100% agree. The other thing is, you know, connect with the thing that you're trying to protect, but also like, do what you love, you know, because I see a lot of people who are like, this is what I want to do. You know, they make this decision with the front of their brain and it's like, well, what do you enjoy doing? You know, because I, I love going into the forest, but then everyone said, okay, well, you better get a PhD in conservation biology. And I was like, uh, back to school. I was like, but I like going out with the native people and going on three week expeditions with them and, hunt, you know, fishing for piranha and learning about the medicinal plants and all this stuff. I don't want to go spend more time in the classroom. And it's funny because a, um, a couple of years ago, a very distinguished biologist who's done amazing work, somebody that I'm a huge fan of and respect greatly. He sent me an email and he was like, Hey, I'm so jealous of you about like something. And I said, what are you, I said, you got to tell me what you're talking about. I said, cause I honestly don't know. And he was like, Oh, well, you've gotten to spend so much time in the field with the locals, like off the grid, not at some research station with a bunch of, you know, PhD candidates from like Connecticut, you know, who are just happened to be in the Amazon. He was like, you've really done. And I was like, huh. You know, there was a point where I thought that that was a, you know, sort of a weakness for me that I was like, oh, I'm just walking around the jungle with these guys. And it's like, well, that's what actually in the end allowed me to be looking at the forest from a native perspective to understand what uh, that whole concept of that. If you, oh, if you just give these people jobs, they'll, they'll, they'll gladly protect it. So there's many things that I learned from that and that, that getting that perspective came from just doing what I loved and what I loved was going around the forest with those guys. That's when I had the most fun was being with them and being out there and being free. And for example, in 2014, I spent some time at a, at someone else's research station, a big important research station in the region. And, uh, you know, they said you have to wear boots at all times, rain boots, big rain boots at all times. And you have to wear fully long pants over the rain boots and you have to, you know, all, all these, they had all these rules, never be without shoes and wear rain boots and, and all this stuff. And don't go out at night, never swim in the river. And all of that was almost borderline an attack on us because for us, me and the, me and the local guys, we never wear shoes. That's part of it. They'd be like, when we would be out hunting, 
I'd have my hiking boots on at like age 19. And I remember the one day they like turned around and he was like, look, he's like, you can come leave the shoes. So you make way too much noise with those shoes, take your shoes off. And of course, for the next month I had is pulling black spikes and thorns and horrible things out of my feet. And you can get bitten by a fertile lance on the foot and die. I mean, anything could happen, but we, we don't wear shoes, you know, when we don't want to wear shoes or when we do wear shoes, a lot of people wear flip flops or, or, you know, light sneakers. Um, and at this research station, they said boots or you don't go outside. Okay. Don't swim in the river. Why? There was no good explanation for that, but it's like the idea of just, you know, being free. There's a, there's a scene in into the wild. Um, I know it's in the movie. I, I forget whether or not it's in the book, but where Chris McCandles wants to, uh, kayak down this one section. I think it's the Colorado river, but it could be a different river too, but where he wants to kayak down this one section of river. And he like goes to like the park office and they're like, Oh yeah, you can do it. But like, you know, it cost you $150 and the wait time is seven years. And he was like, excuse me. He's like, it's a river on earth. I wish to go down it. Like if I, and he was like, no, and of course in the story, he goes and does it anyway. Um, the guy who think. moved to Alaska and, and died. That, yeah. yeah. That okay. guy. But yeah, that that scene of just like you know that sort of like authoritarian like you know yeah it's nature but we control it and we say when you can access it it's like oh well you know if i if i want to go barefoot and get spikes in my feet please let me you know try going to a beach in new jersey you need a barcode oh, oh, and a I don't, barcode I don't. and like the whole code thing <laughs> <laughs> i i did that one time as a teenager and i showed up and then you know, it was like you got to I think it was like, you know, they like a, you had to pay to walk on the beach. You couldn't have a dog. Yeah, there's, like, there's 19,000 rules you got as soon as you walked up. And I was just like, look, you know, I'll, I'm going to go somewhere else. And of course, there's so many beaches where you can go and do whatever you want and, you know, just bring your dog and sit on the beach. And uh, yeah, I, I try to stay away from those places where there's that kind of rules because that's not, that's not me. Well, our world is going there right now, but, um, but I'm curious, how can people listening who want to come adventure with you in, with, in a place with no rules? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell us a about <laughs> That's a dangerous thing to advertise it has. Um, well, Tamandu Expeditions is still running. It's been running since day one. Um, and 16 years in, we have better, we've gotten better at it as guides, our locations, everything. And so we take people into some of the most pristine parts of the Amazon that are reachable and see species like harpy eagles, anacondas, jaguars, all the turtles and butterflies and monkeys, 13 species of monkeys on our river, um, beautiful lakes and rivers uh, and ancient trees. And people get to see what we do and how we do it. And we're always, you know, taking beautiful photos and going on adventures and exploring new parts of the forest and that is uh, linked all over my Instagram. And we have a website, tamanduajungle.com. But it's funny because people keep saying, they're like, how could I one day do that? And I'm like, just sign up. Like, not one day, just sign up and come down. I mean, we have basic requirements on like fitness and you have to be like, you know, even, even aside from COVID, you got to be like, you know, vaxxed up to travel to the Amazon, get your hepe, you know, and, and dengue and whatever else. But other than that, it's get your passport and show up. And we've had people from 11 years old to 75. We bring college, you know, we bring um, study abroads. We have undergrad college students showing up doing research on medicinal compounds and studying bioluminescent fungus under trees and some amazing stuff. And of course, now when you come, you get to see the new Jungle Keeper station and all the other stuff that we're doing. You, we're always driving by the rangers and waving as they're, they're going up and down on their patrols. So it's like the, the it's, it's super exciting. It's the wildlife. We're actually having one of the greatest things that we're having that's really encouraging is that the last 15 years, we really don't have jaguar sightings on the side of the river. The jaguars on Las Piedras sort of know there's been a lot of logging in the past has been boats and they could get shot at. And it's like the last few years, I think, I think last month we had three different Jaguar sightings on the side of the river. And in November, um, me and JJ and Dina, who uh, all of us are, are co-founders of, of jungle keepers. We were all standing on the riverbank at night, about 10 feet away from a Jaguar that came out of the river cane and was just looking at us. And because of the headline, headlamp she couldn't see us and we were just as close as you could possibly get to a live living jaguar um without being in her mouth 
Um, and that's, that's really encouraging because the animals, it seems like the animals are getting the message that it's like, okay, we're good here. You know, we don't, we don't have to worry about being hunted as much. So yeah, we have uh Tamandua is, is a thing. Jungle keepers. There's so many exciting things happening with jungle keepers that, you know, we have the support, the big time support, but then there's also little things like, you know, our Rangers constantly need cell phones, not only for, for, taking photos in the field like if they see, see cool species and documenting things but they actually run their their ranger program gps the smart ranger program they run it off of their phones and so like little things like having people donate their old cell phones or having people like help out on like graphic design or social media or legal stuff it's like we still need people all the time so jungle keepers it's junglekeepers.org and at jungle keepers on instagram and we're constantly updating people. We constantly have little things that we need. And, and the reason I bring that up is because everyone's going, how can I help? How can I help? And it's like, pretty much, you probably have something in your roster as an adult human that, that could help. And we get so many little things from so many people. I mean, we're literally just um, some really exciting, we, we can't wait to release. We have Jungle Keeper shirts coming out, but it's like, from the drawing I did on a sketchbook to somebody like making that into a graphic image with somebody else and then somebody who could actually print them onto good t-shirts. And it's like, that matters, you know, in the end, having cool t-shirts where people could go, you know, what is, what is, what's that t-shirt you're wearing? It's like, oh, this is jungle keepers. They support, you know, they protect all this acreage in the Amazon. And it's like, there's so many little things that people can help with. Um, so it's exciting. It's just getting bigger and bigger. We're getting more rangers. We're protecting more forests. There's more people learning about it. Good time. Mm. I'm so excited for you and, and grateful for you and grateful for your energy and your work. And, you know, it's like you have such a positive attitude towards it. That's the thing, right? It's like so many, so many people, um, there is this defeat, defeat, defeated yeah. energy around it, but you're excited and it's because you love the jungle and um, I love you. I'm so excited. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to have this conversation. One last nugget. I want you to just tune into your jungle over there, your little spot on the earth where you know, the place mm. you know, and what is a message? What is a message from that jungle that you want to share with the world right now? I mean, you already did. <laughs> such a, yeah, that's such a beautiful sort of thought. Um, and I feel like that's, that's what my whole job is, is spreading that message. Because like when you see a family of spider monkeys in the morning and they're waking up, you know, and the, the mom will have her, you know, her arms around and the baby will be like looking out at you down, like down. And the whole forest is there. It's like, if these animals could say one thing, if they could ask us one thing, what would it be? And I always ask myself when I'm in the forest and it's literally just, please don't incinerate our home. You know, it's, re it's, re it's really simple. I mean, the jungle, the jungle is a pretty violent place. There's always something getting eaten and, you know, something dying or being born. It's, it's a constant turnover, but on a peaceful morning in the sunlight, when the forest is waking up, if you said, you know, hey, everybody, real quick, in, in, in human words, what do you want? They'd probably be like, just to not, just to have this to live in. Like, it's really simple. Um, although you could also flip that and sort of the Brooklyn in me makes, makes me want to think that the animals could also be like, hey, look, like if you want to keep breathing, why don't you just let us keep doing the thing that makes your life possible? That too. Uh, <laughs> There's this two, this two parts of my personality. I love um, it. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think, I think that the message would be just, you know, that we, we rely on this stuff and there's absolutely no reason as incredibly smart animals that we are that, that have figured out zoom calls and airplanes and all the amazing heart transplants and all the amazing things that we've figured out. Um, I don't think that the world is on its way out and about to die. And it's like, yeah, we're in an extinction crisis right now. And there are some serious things, but just like the industrial revolution was like a, a growth period for us. And it was a time when we said, okay, we have all this new technology. How do we, how do we not pollute everything and kill all the children in the factories? Like it took some time before we brought it back and said, okay, here's how you make safe work conditions. And here's how you keep the rivers clean enough that we can still live. And I feel like with the environment, it's like, all right, we got this huge population and we can, we can do these amazing things. I mean, we, we are at an amazing point in history um and i really feel like it's just it's just we just need to balance it out you know we've, we've gotten really powerful and like we just need to remember that all these other species exist for their own inherent reasons um and that we depend on them you can't pull us out of it either nothing nothing can be pulled out we're part of we're part of nature so we are nature we are it yeah thank you so much paul thank you so much it's good talking to you you too you too we'll have you we'll I'm going to share all your links, let everybody know where they can find you and 
we'll, we'll keep in touch because I want to know what else you're doing next. <laughs> yeah, man, getting ready to get ready, getting ready to head down soon. I got about a month and I got to train up because uh, actually I when I was down there, the last time I was down there, I actually got COVID and was on my ass for weeks. Um, that 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 took it out of me for sure. And so uh, physical wise, I got to I'm just now starting to get back into it and like try and build my numbers back up to what they were before that. Uh, I want to end up. You got the antibodies now, right? You're strong. Oh, I got the best kind. Yeah, I got the real natural ones. <laughs> it was funny though, because I was, I was like walking through the forest and, you know, we walk like, you know, six, seven hours a day through the jungle in the heat with the backpack, all that stuff. And I was getting to like six o'clock at night and I was going, I didn't even have energy to eat dinner. I just fall asleep. And for like a few days, I was like, I definitely have dengue again. And I've had dengue like five or six times. And then I finally was like sick enough that I went back to town and got tested. And they're like, no, you got COVID, kid. And I was like, oh, no wonder. Awesome. Awesome. It's, yeah. you know, and look at you, healthy man. Yeah, <laughs> You're man. with us Gotta today. Keep going. Show us. You can heal. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And it helps, like you said, you know, getting this out to your community and everything, it helps. Everybody can help in their own way. And like just people hearing about this, you don't know who's going to hear about this and help jungle keepers or start their own organization or whatever it is. So um, good I'm work. Here. Keep doing yeah. it. It's all support you and support the amazing work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Catalyst Talks. Stay tuned for what's up next and please subscribe to our podcast and rate us wherever you listen. You'll find these all at catalysttalks.com. Join the conversation on social media. And if you'd like to reach out, please send me, Stephanie, a private message through stephanietraker.com. Your attention means the world to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you.